you will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. So, how did you get into hypnotherapy in the first place? I was having trouble sleeping. You see, it had gone on for so long. I'd actually started doing a bit of research into hypnosis, and well, although there seems to be no doubt that it can be incredibly effective.、Hmm. Mind you, I was very apprehensive about going down the same route myself. I can tell you. But I'd been prescribed some mild sleeping pills, and anyway, I decided to go and see a hypnotherapist because I honestly felt that I was on the verge of becoming addicted to them. Yeah,、uh, I see what you mean. And although I never felt that I really went under, as it were, afterwards, I had the best night's sleep I'd had in years.、Oh, well, that just goes to show. And after the session. The insomnia sort of、uh, cleared up. I, I learned something subconsciously, <laughs> but I'm still a bit sceptical. Funnily enough, I actually had hypnosis for about two years,、oh. and、uh, after the first session, my mind seemed razor sharp, and I had this feeling of great power.、Mm. It, it only took a minute or so to put me to sleep. Ooh, very different from my experience, then. <laughs> well, yes, very. In fact, when I woke up, I felt I could fight King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> But it also helped me to concentrate on my game and 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 block out the crowd.、Oh, right. I must admit, I've always had a kind of fascination with the creative possibilities of our subconscious. Yeah, me too. Apparently. We only use ten percent of our brain, so it's not surprising that it's capable of things we haven't even got a clue about. So, how did you get into hypnotherapy in the first place? I was having trouble sleeping. You see, it had gone on for so long. I'd actually started doing a bit of research into hypnosis, and well, although. There seems to be no doubt that it can be incredibly effective.、Mm. Mind you, I was very apprehensive about going down the same route myself. I can tell you, <laughs> but I'd been prescribed some mild sleeping pills, and <sighs> anyway, I decided to go and see a hypnotherapist because I honestly felt that I was on the verge of becoming addicted to them. Yeah,、uh, I see what you mean. And. Although I never felt that I really went under, as it were, afterwards, I had the best night's sleep I'd had in years.、Oh, well, that just goes to show. And after the session, the insomnia sort of、uh, cleared up. I, I learned something subconsciously. <laughs> But I'm still a bit sceptical. Funnily enough, I actually had hypnosis for about two years,、oh. and、uh, after the first session, my mind seemed razor sharp, and I had this feeling of great power.、Mm. It, it only took a minute or so to put me to sleep. Ooh, very different from my experience, then. <laughs> well, yes, very. In fact, when I woke up, I felt I could fight King Kong. <laughs> But it also helped me to concentrate on my game and 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 block out the crowd.、Oh, right. I must admit, I've always had a kind of fascination with the creative possibilities of our subconscious. Yeah, me too. Apparently, we only use ten percent of our brain, so it's not surprising that it's capable of things we haven't even got a clue about. Extract two. In many countries, smoking's now very much frowned upon. Smokers are treated like social outcasts and have to retreat outside public places 
if they want to indulge their habit, but giving it up isn't that easy. Most of us know someone who's tried to give it up at some point or another. Maybe you've even tried yourself, or been egged on by friends and family to do it. The first time, yes, it does seem to work, up until lunchtime, anyway. The second time, well, you don't feel like having a cigarette for twenty-four hours, but the urge slowly comes back, and you just know you are going to fail. You feel cynical about it. You might tell your friends the timing just wasn't right. The excuses are endless, but there's something completely different that those desperate to kick the habit could try, which might just work, and that is hypnosis treatment. While you're under, they repeat a word, freedom, to you, and when you come round, you think of it every time you have a craving. But by the time you think of the word. You have no desire to light up another cigarette. All you have to do is be absolutely determined that you want to give up. And it's not only smoking that it works for. Do you ever suffer from stage fright, for example? With the help of hypnosis, you'll find that all your first night fears are dissolved. All you then need to do is look forward to playing the character. And while on stage, you should simply become that character. Try a session under hypnosis and see. You'll be able to talk yourself into a semi-hypnotic state any time you're under stress. For instance, when you're flying, you won't be scared any more. It'll just help you to relax. In many countries, smoking's now very much frowned upon. Smokers are treated like social outcasts and have to retreat outside public places if they want to indulge their habit. But giving it up isn't that easy. Most of us know someone who's tried to give it up at some point or another. Maybe you've even tried yourself, or been egged on by friends and family to do it. The first time, yes, it does seem to work, up until lunchtime, anyway. The second time, well, you don't feel like having a cigarette for twenty-four hours, but the urge slowly comes back, and you just know you are going to fail. You feel cynical about it. You might tell your friends the timing just wasn't right. The excuses are endless, but there's something completely different that those desperate to kick the habit could try, which might just work. And that is hypnosis treatment. While you're under, they repeat a word, freedom, to you, and when you come round, you think of it every time you have a craving. But by the time you think of the word, you have no desire to light up another cigarette. All you have to do is be absolutely determined that you want to give up. And it's not only smoking that it works for. Do you ever suffer from stage fright, for example? With the help of hypnosis, you'll find that all your first night fears are dissolved. All you then need to do is look forward to playing the character, and while on stage, you should simply become that character. Try a session under hypnosis and see. You'll be able to talk yourself into a semi-hypnotic state any time you're under stress. For instance, when you're flying, you won't be scared any more. It'll just help you to relax. Extract three. Medical emergencies are everyone's biggest nightmare, aren't they? The idea of suddenly falling ill on a long journey, particularly if you happen to find yourself in a critical situation on a plane, can put you off the idea of travelling further afield altogether. 
If you're lucky, there might be a doctor on board the plane. But if you're unlucky, a first aid kit may not be enough to deal with your complaint. And even if the plane was able to make an emergency landing, it may be a very long way to the nearest hospital. One major airline now boasts a next-generation improvement on this situation. A doctor who can monitor a patient's condition from the ground via satellite transmission. The telemedicine link shows vital signs such as blood pressure, temperature and oxygen in the blood. To check on a passenger, flight attendants who've undergone basic medical training first attach sensors to the patient. A monitoring unit then plugs into the plane's satellite communication system and this allows continuous two-way communication between the plane and the airport. The doctor on the ground receives the signals through a computer and then decides whether the patient could safely be treated by the crew or whether an emergency landing is necessary. A comforting thought, isn't it? Medical emergencies are everyone's biggest nightmare, aren't they? The idea of suddenly falling ill on a long journey, particularly if you happen to find yourself in a critical situation on a plane, can put you off the idea of travelling further afield altogether. If you're lucky, there might be a doctor on board the plane. But if you're unlucky... A first aid kit may not be enough to deal with your complaint. And even if the plane was able to make an emergency landing, it may be a very long way to the nearest hospital. One major airline now boasts a next-generation improvement on this situation. A doctor who can monitor a patient's condition from the ground via satellite transmission. The telemedicine link shows vital signs such as blood pressure, temperature and oxygen in the blood. To check on a passenger, flight attendants who've undergone basic medical training first attach sensors to the patient. A monitoring unit then plugs into the plane's satellite communication system and this allows continuous two-way communication between the plane and the airport. The doctor on the ground receives the signals through a computer and then decides whether the patient could safely be treated by the crew or whether an emergency landing is necessary. A comforting thought, isn't it? That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. We'll hear a talk about the first science fiction book written by Mary Shelley. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. Although science fiction is often considered to be a fairly modern literary genre, it has a long tradition. By the end of the 19th century, novels involving science and fantasy had already become popular. But, as James Renshaw explains, the genre goes back even further. The first novel that is generally recognised as a work of science fiction is Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley in 1817. Mary Shelley had an unconventional and often tragic life, she was the only child of Mary Wollstonecraft, the famous feminist, and William Godwin, a philosopher and novelist. She never knew her mother, who died in childbirth, but her father had the very highest expectations of her. Her earliest years were imbued with a peculiar sort of Gothicism. On most days, she would go for a walk with her father to the St Pancras churchyard to visit her mother's grave, 
and Godwin taught her to read and spell her name by getting her to trace her mother's inscription on the gravestone. From an early age, she was surrounded by famous philosophers, writers and poets. Coleridge made his first visit when Mary was two years old. At the age of 16, Mary ran away to live with the 21-year-old poet Percy Shelley, despite the fact that he was already married at the time. Although she was cast out of society, even by her father, this inspirational liaison produced her masterpiece, Frankenstein. She conceived of the novel when she was just 19 and was spending the summer with Shelley in Switzerland. On the night of June the 16th, Mary and Percy Shelley could not return to their home due to an incredible storm and spent the night at the Villa Diodati with the poet Lord Byron. The group read aloud a collection of German ghost stories, and this inspired Byron to challenge them all to write a ghost story. Mary spent a week thinking of a suitable subject for her story, and it came to her when she had what she called a waking nightmare. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away, hope that this thing would subside into dead matter. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains. In her story, the monster is created by a young student, Victor Frankenstein, who assembles the creature from various body parts he collects from graveyards and slaughterhouses. The creature he creates escapes and flees to the woods. At first he is innocent and lonely, but he begins to change when he is rejected and attacked by humans because of his horrifying appearance. The creature realises that the only hope of escaping from total isolation is for Victor Frankenstein to create a female for him, which he initially agrees to do. However, Victor then changes his mind, and this leads the monster to embark on a course of horrifying revenge. Mary completed the novel in May of 1817, and when it was published the following year, it became a huge success. The same, however, could not be said of her personal life, which was marred by further tragedies. Mary and Shelley married, but fierce public hostility towards the couple drove them to Italy. Initially they were happy, but two of their children died there, and Mary never fully recovered. When Mary was only 24, her husband drowned, leaving her alone with a two-year-old son. For her remaining 29 years, she lived in England, which she despised because of the morality and social system. She was shunned by conventional circles and worked as a professional writer to support her father and her son. Mary became an invalid at the age of 48. She died in 1851 of a brain tumour with poetic timing. The Great Exhibition which was a showcase of technological progress, was opened. This was the same scientific technology that she had warned against in her most famous book, Frankenstein. Although science fiction is often considered to be a fairly modern literary genre, it has a long tradition. By the end of the 19th century, novels involving science and fantasy had already become popular, but, as James Renshaw explains, the genre goes back even further. The first novel that is generally recognised as a work of science fiction is Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley in 1817. Mary Shelley had an unconventional and often tragic life. She was the only child of Mary Wollstonecraft, the famous feminist, and William Godwin, a philosopher and novelist. She never knew her mother, who died in childbirth, but her father had the very highest expectations of her. Her earliest years were imbued with a peculiar sort of Gothicism. On most days she would go for a walk with her father to the St Pancras churchyard to visit her mother's grave, and Godwin taught her to read and spell her name by getting her to trace her mother's inscription on the gravestone. 
From an early age, she was surrounded by famous philosophers, writers and poets. Coleridge made his first visit when Mary was two years old. At the age of 16, Mary ran away to live with the 21-year-old poet Percy Shelley, despite the fact that he was already married at the time. Although she was cast out of society, even by her father, this inspirational liaison produced her masterpiece, Frankenstein. She conceived of the novel when she was just 19 and was spending the summer with Shelley in Switzerland. On the night of June the 16th, Mary and Percy Shelley could not return to their home due to an incredible storm and spent the night at the Villa Diodati with the poet Lord Byron. The group read aloud a collection of German ghost stories, and this inspired Byron to challenge them all to write a ghost story. Mary spent a week thinking of a suitable subject for her story, and it came to her when she had what she called a waking nightmare. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away, hope that this thing would subside into dead matter. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains. In her story, the monster is created by a young student, Victor Frankenstein, who assembles the creature from various body parts he collects from graveyards and slaughterhouses. The creature he creates escapes and flees to the woods. At first he is innocent and lonely, but he begins to change when he is rejected and attacked by humans because of his horrifying appearance. The creature realises that the only hope of escaping from total isolation is for Victor Frankenstein to create a female for him, which he initially agrees to do. However, Victor then changes his mind, and this leads the monster to embark on a course of horrifying revenge. Mary completed the novel in May of 1817, and when it was published the following year, it became a huge success. The same, however, could not be said of her personal life, which was marred by further tragedies. Mary and Shelley married, but fierce public hostility towards the couple drove them to Italy. Initially they were happy, but two of their children died there, and Mary never fully recovered. When Mary was only twenty-four, her husband drowned, leaving her alone with a two-year-old son. For her remaining twenty-nine years, she lived in England, which she despised because of the morality and social system. She was shunned by conventional circles and worked as a professional writer to support her father and her son. Mary became an invalid at the age of forty-eight. She died in 1851 of a brain tumour with poetic timing. The Great Exhibition, which was a showcase of technological progress, was opened. This was the same scientific technology that she had warned against in her most famous book, Frankenstein. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear a group of art history students going round an art gallery with their teacher. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have a minute in which to look at part three.
Now, let's move along to the next gallery. Uh, whose turn is it to tell us about the next painting? Amanda, is it you? Uh, yes, uh, this is the one I've prepared. Good. Now, I've got one or two questions for Amanda to guide us through this painting. So if you could all pay attention, we can get started. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> thank you. Now, as you can see, it's a pre-Raphaelite painting. So we're talking 1880, 1890. Mm. And what can you tell us about this and other pre-Raphaelite paintings, for that matter, compared to what came before? Well, there was very definitely a reaction against some of the earlier concerns. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the pre-Raphaelites didn't believe in the idea that it was important to be true to nature or realistic. Uh -huh. uh, this is a good example. It's by the painter Burne Jones, completed in 1884, and it shows a lot about his philosophy of painting. Um, OK, and what was it exactly? Well, in his own words... <laughs> Is it OK if I use my notes? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, he said that a painting should be a beautiful romantic dream of something that never was, never will be, in a land that no one can define or remember, only desire. So, in other words, the very opposite of realism. Mm. No practical lessons for modern industrial societies or whatever. Yes, exactly. And this painting is in many ways very typical of Burne Jones, in fact, his wife later said it was his most distinctive work, the one that really summed up what he thought. OK. Tell us about the story it tells. Um, it's called King Cophetua and the Beggar Maid, mm -hmm. and it's based on an old legend from early medieval times about a king who falls in love with a beggar girl and finds that his love for her is greater than all his wealth and power. Was it a well-known story? Mm, yes, uh, most people knew it well, uh, but only through reading Tennyson's poetry, in which he wrote about it, rather than from the original story. So it's another example of what we were talking about earlier, the link between the romantic movement in literature and the movements in art. Uh, do go on. Uh, in the painting, the artist imagines the king sitting at the girl's feet, gazing at her in adoration. Mm -hmm. Burne Jones said he was determined that the king should look like a king and the beggar should look like a queen. And he had certain details, um, such as the crown and the maid's dress, specially made for him so that he could capture the detail. The setting has echoes of 15th century Italian art, particularly Mantegna and Crivelli, and it's all elaborately decorated with highly wrought textures and jewel-like colours. If you look at the clothing, you can see what I mean. Hmm. The two characters in the background have got these rich flowing clothes, and there's the same richness in the king's flowing cloak. So what is he trying to tell us about here? What about these anemones? Do they have any particular significance, do you think? Mm, yes. The maid is holding a bunch of anemones, and if you look closely, you can see that some of them have fallen on the steps by the king. The flowers are a symbol of unrequited love, and there's a lot of personal feeling in this painting, as there is in much of his work. At the time he was doing this, Burne Jones had met and fallen in love with a girl called Frances Graham, but she then married someone else. Ah. So it's likely that the king represents Burne Jones, and the queen represents Frances Graham. And the painting shows his feeling about losing the woman he loved. Are there any other themes that the audience in 1884 would have recognised, apart from on this personal level? Mm, yes. To the general public, it would have had a completely different meaning, which they would have recognised quite easily. They would interpret the painting as being about the rejection of worldly wealth and the elevation of love above everything else. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And that was a message that was very close to Burne Jones's heart and was very relevant for late Victorian Britain. Well, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> and now we'll move on to the next artist. Now, let's move along to the next gallery. Uh, whose turn is it to tell us about the next painting? Amanda, is it you? Uh, yes, this is the one I've prepared. Good. Now, I've got one or two questions for Amanda to guide us through this painting. So if you could all pay attention, we can get started. Brian. <laughs> thank, 
Thank you. Now, as you can see, it's a pre-Raphaelite painting. So we're talking 1880, 1890. Mm. And what can you tell us about this and other pre-Raphaelite paintings, for that matter, compared to what came before? Well, there was very definitely a reaction against some of the earlier concerns. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the pre-Raphaelites didn't believe in the idea that it was important to be true to nature or realistic. Uh -huh. uh, this is a good example. It's by the painter Burne Jones, completed in 1884, and it shows a lot about his philosophy of painting. Um, OK, and what was it exactly? Well, in his own words... <laughs> Is it OK if I use my notes? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, he said that a painting should be a beautiful romantic dream of something that never was, never will be, in a land that no one can define or remember, only desire. So, in other words, the very opposite of realism. Mm. No practical lessons for modern industrial societies or whatever. Yes, exactly. And this painting is in many ways very typical of Burne Jones, in fact, his wife later said it was his most distinctive work, the one that really summed up what he thought. OK. Tell us about the story it tells. Um, it's called King Cophetua and the Beggar Maid, mm -hmm. and it's based on an old legend from early medieval times about a king who falls in love with a beggar girl and finds that his love for her is greater than all his wealth and power. Was it a well-known story? Mm, yes, uh, most people knew it well, uh, but only through reading Tennyson's poetry, in which he wrote about it, rather than from the original story. So it's another example of what we were talking about earlier, the link between the romantic movement in literature and the movements in art. Uh, do go on. Uh, in the painting, the artist imagines the king sitting at the girl's feet, gazing at her in adoration. Mm -hmm. Burne Jones said he was determined that the king should look like a king and the beggar should look like a queen. And he had certain details, um, such as the crown and the maid's dress, specially made for him so that he could capture the detail. The setting has echoes of 15th century Italian art, particularly Mantegna and Crivelli, and it's all elaborately decorated with highly wrought textures and jewel-like colours. If you look at the clothing, you can see what I mean. Hmm. The two characters in the background have got these rich, flowing clothes, and there's the same richness in the king's flowing cloak. So what is he trying to tell us about here? What about these anemones? Do they have any particular significance, do you think? Mm, yes. The maid is holding a bunch of anemones, and if you look closely, you can see that some of them have fallen on the steps by the king. The flowers are a symbol of unrequited love, and there's a lot of personal feeling in this painting, as there is in much of his work. At the time he was doing this, Burne Jones had met and fallen in love with a girl called Frances Graham, but she then married someone else. Ah. So it's likely that the king represents Burne Jones, and the queen represents Frances Graham. And the painting shows his feeling about losing the woman he loved. Are there any other themes that the audience in 1884 would have recognised, apart from on this personal level? Mm, yes. To the general public, it would have had a completely different meaning, which they would have recognised quite easily. They would interpret the painting as being about the rejection of worldly wealth and the elevation of love above everything else. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And that was a message that was very close to Burne Jones's heart and was very relevant for late Victorian Britain. <laughs> well, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> and now we'll move on to the next artist. <laughs> that is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about problematic relationships they have had with people at work. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says caused the problems. Now look at task two. Questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what step each speaker took to solve the problems. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part four.
Speaker one. You'll probably think me a bit naive, but at the interviews, I was totally convinced that my new boss and I would get along like a house on fire. It was only when I'd been there just over a week that I realised、uh, how mistaken I was. She and I were just chalk and cheese, and I knew things would never be any different. I thought it would be a wise move to try and stick it out for a reasonable amount of time. You've got to think about what it looks like on your CV, haven't you? But in the end, I decided not to make a big thing of it. Just cut my losses and head off elsewhere. Speaker two. The office is great. There's a good atmosphere, and all the staff make a real effort to work well as a team. Except for this one guy who seems to think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. To say he's overbearing is putting it mildly. It really got me down after a while, and I got to the stage when I used to dread going into work. But then I thought, why should I let him call the shots? Better to think about something else when he starts giving us the benefit of his opinions, and just let him get on with it. And it's work to treat. When he gets no reaction, he just sort of wanders off. Speaker three. I'd only been in the job a short while. It's a really busy office environment, and nobody seemed to have much time to show me the ropes. So, I suppose making some kind of slip up was inevitable. But what upset me was the way my line manager dealt with the mistake I'd made. Instead of being supportive, all she did was lash out at me for not having taken the time and trouble to find out exactly what I should have done. I was pretty fed up, I can tell you. So much so that I decided to take it to the powers that be and make my grievances official. Speaker four. Everyone said my colleague and I were like two peas in a pod. <laughs> We agreed on pretty much everything, and things were going brilliantly. We had a really successful working relationship. That is, until we both decided to apply for the same promotion. I thought we could both handle it, but almost immediately I noticed a change in her attitude—a kind of professional rivalry, you might call it. The atmosphere between us got so bad that I knew I only had one course of action left to me. I decided my mental well-being was far more important than getting involved in psychological warfare, so I withdrew my application. Speaker five. I've always enjoyed my work, and it takes a lot to upset me. But since this new supervisor's been on the scene, I'm just about at the end of my tether. All she does is pile more and more responsibility onto my shoulders. It's not as if we've had any serious fallings out or anything like that. Actually, I quite like her. No, it's almost as if she's floundering a bit herself, and she's desperately trying to find a way to cope. I spent a few sleepless nights wondering what to do about it, and eventually, I decided to get it all off my chest and have it out with her. Speaker one. You'll probably think me a bit naive, but at the interviews, I was totally convinced that my new boss and I would get along like a house on fire. It was only when I'd been there just over a week that I realised、uh, how mistaken I was. She and I were just chalk and cheese, and I knew things would never be any different. I thought it would be a wise move to try and stick it out for a reasonable amount of time. You've got to think about what it looks like on your CV, haven't you? But in the end, I decided not to make a big thing of it. Just cut my losses and head off elsewhere. Speaker two. The office is great. There's a good atmosphere, and all the staff make a real effort to work well as a team. Except for this one guy who seems to think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. To say he's overbearing is putting it mildly. 
It really got me down after a while, and I got to the stage when I used to dread going into work. But then I thought, why should I let him call the shots? Better to think about something else when he starts giving us the benefit of his opinions and just let him get on with it. And it's work to treat. When he gets no reaction, he just sort of wanders off. Speaker 3 I'd only been in the job a short while. It's a really busy office environment and nobody seemed to have much time to show me the ropes, so I suppose making some kind of slip-up was inevitable. But what upset me was the way my line manager dealt with the mistake I'd made. Instead of being supportive, all she did was lash out at me for not having taken the time and trouble to find out exactly what I should have done. I was pretty fed up, I can tell you. So much so that I decided to take it to the powers that be and make my grievances official. Speaker 4 Everyone said my colleague and I were like two peas in a pod. <laughs> we agreed on pretty much everything, and things were going brilliantly. We had a really successful working relationship. That is, until we both decided to apply for the same promotion. I thought we could both handle it, but almost immediately I noticed a change in her attitude. A kind of professional rivalry, you might call it. The atmosphere between us got so bad that I knew I only had one course of action left to me. I decided my mental well-being was far more important than getting involved in psychological warfare, so I withdrew my application. Speaker 5 I've always enjoyed my work, and it takes a lot to upset me. But since this new supervisor's been on the scene, I'm just about at the end of my tether. All she does is pile more and more responsibility onto my shoulders. It's not as if we've had any serious fallings out or anything like that. Actually, I quite like her. No, it's almost as if she's floundering a bit herself and she's desperately trying to find a way to cope. I spent a few sleepless nights wondering what to do about it and eventually I decided to get it all off my chest and have it out with her. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. <laughs>